Hello, welcome to the Midnight Storytellers Legacy Project. My name is Chloe and if you make yourself comfortable, I have a festive story to tell you. Icy wind whistled around the battlements. But inside the castle at Carlisle, King Arthur and all the court were sitting back and sleepy and full after their Christmas Day feast. Quite honestly, it had got to the point where everyone was a little too warm and the clothes were a little too tight and even the king had surreptitiously loosened his belt and his eyelids were drooping and there was some old storyteller in the corner mumbling into his beard. And suddenly, Arthur had had enough of everything. He thumped his fist on the table and everybody startled awake and the king said, look at you all. We are supposed to be the honor of Britain. We are supposed to be chivalrous knights and magnificent ladies and look at us all here with our snouts in the trough. It is not good enough. We should be adventuring. We should be winning more honor and renown for Britain. And what have we come to? Well, I must set the example. And I am saying that I shall not leave this hall today unless and until some great adventure shall come to us. No sooner had Arthur spoken those words than outside the hall there was a clap of thunder and the great doors at the far end swung open and as everybody turned to stare, a little pony trotted down the steps into the hall and the pony was carrying a woman, a damsel in distress and as the little piebald pony trotted between the tables up towards Arthur and Guinevere and the rest. No one had ever seen such a distressed damsel. She almost reclined on the pony's back. She had long, dark, curling hair. She had bright, gleaming eyes. Her dress was um, off most of one shoulder. She had pale, pale, perfect flesh and everyone was staring at her as she rode that pony up to the high table and slipped off the pony's back onto her knees right in front of Arthur and she looked up at him and said, Your Majesty, Your Majesty, I beg you to help me. You are the only one who can help me now. And of course Arthur was, <laughs> Arthur was staring as much as everybody else and the distressed damsel continued, your Majesty, please, I beg you, I don't know where else to turn. I have lost my true love. We were out riding, celebrating the festive day, and, and there was this black knight, and he challenged my true love to a duel, and they fought, and my love lost, and the black knight captured him and carried him away. And I do not know where he has gone, and I don't know how to search for him. Please, Your Majesty, Arthur, High King of all Britain, I beg you to help me. And Arthur said, I shall. And the hall was in uproar. Guinevere was trying to persuade him that it was too dangerous, and Lancelot and Sir Gawain and even Sir Kay, the master of sarcasm, even Sir Kay was trying to tell Arthur, look, you cannot risk yourself like this. You are the High King. It is too dangerous. But Arthur would have none of it. And in all the tumult, Neither he nor anyone else noticed that the distressed damsel and her strange bicoloured pony, well, they'd vanished. An hour later, King Arthur and Sir Gawain and a small group of guards were riding out of the castle up towards the moors. It was a proper winter afternoon, freezing cold, deep snow everywhere. And in the sky, red gold streaks of sunset. And Arthur decided to take the shortcut through the woods. 
and in moments he'd become separated from Sir Gawain and the soldiers and they couldn't find him, they couldn't catch up with him and Arthur rode up alone onto the top of the hills, onto the moors. And no sooner had he got out there than his horse spooked and there was mist. There was a thick and swirling fog that wrapped around Arthur and his horse. And Arthur thought he knew which direction he was riding and he thought he knew that he had turned his horse around and then he realized he was completely lost and the horse was stumbling along the track. So Arthur reined in and listened. And a moment later, there came the sound of hoofbeats, a heavy horses hoofbeats. And the moment after that, the mists parted and there was a gigantic black war horse carrying a knight in black armor. The knight reined his war horse in back on its haunches. It tossed its head, its black mane flew. Foam flew from its mouth. Its eyes gleamed red, possibly with the sunset. And Arthur drew himself up. Who are you and what do you want from me? From inside the black battle helm came a deep and mocking laughter. Ah, little king, you have come to me. You have come to be my prisoner. I shall put you in my dungeon with the others and there you will rot until you die. And Arthur said, if you cannot give me courtesy, then I shall give you battle. And he went to draw his sword. And this story might have gone quite differently if Arthur had been carrying Excalibur. But it was Christmas Day. It was an afternoon's adventure. Who needed a magical battle sword on a Christmas afternoon adventure? So Arthur was carrying a sword suitable for a king, but it wasn't Excalibur. There was no magical protection. And the next that Arthur knew, an evil enchantment had seized a hold of him. The king on his horse was seized and held by magic, held frozen on the spot, the horse with his hoof raised and Arthur barely able to breathe. But he could feel his heart thudding inside his chest. And again, the knight in black armor was laughing at him. Now I have you. Now you are helpless. You are weak and futile and stupid as a woman. And this made Arthur boil with rage inside. He never thought a woman was stupid. He was married to Queen Guinevere. The ladies of the court were some of the most intelligent and witty in all of Britain. He would never have said that of any woman. But now Arthur realized that he did still have his voice and he, he thought about some clever response, but the magic still held him fast. He could not move, he could not fight. There was only one thing left for him to do. And Arthur looked down and then he said to the Black Knight, you have the advantage of me. I cannot give you battle. Therefore, I must ask you to spare me. I must beg you to spare my life. And if there is any gift or boon that I may grant you, if it is within my power and the law to do so, then I shall. And again from inside that black battle helm, there came the sniggering deep laughter. Well, you are the first to get past his pride. I'll give you that. And Arthur said, I am the high king of all Britain. I cannot afford pride. I must return to take care of my people and look after the land. And that gave the black knight pause. 
I see. You take your duties seriously. Very well. I will let you go free for now. I will spare your life on condition that you return to me. You will return to me, little king. You will take a great risk. It will be an adventure such as you have never had before. <laughs> I'm going to ask you a question and you shall return with the answer to this place at this hour on the first day of the new year. Do you agree to this adventure? Arthur said, you wish me to give my assent before I even know what the question might be? Yes, little king, I will test your courage. I will test your spirit. And Arthur knew he had no choice at all. He said, very well, Sir Knight, I accept your terms. Now what is this question you would have me answer? There was a muffled rumbling inside the battle helm. And then the Black Knight said, the question you must answer is this. What is it that women truly desire? King Arthur very nearly smiled and just stopped himself in time. Was he not married to Guinevere, one of the cleverest women in all Britain? Were her ladies-in-waiting not witty and wise and intelligent? Of course he could answer that question. But he merely said, yes, Sir Knight, I will bring you the answer to this place at this time on the first day of the new year. And the next moment, the Black Knight reined his horse around and galloped away into the mists. The mists lifted and parted, and Arthur was free with his horse to return to the castle of Carlisle. And when the fuss of his safe return was, was done, Arthur went to Guinevere and he asked her the question, Madam, tell me, please, what is it that women truly desire? What do they truly want? And Guinevere looked at him and smiled a little and thought a little and she gave him an answer. But the moment that she did that, one of her ladies in waiting stepped forward and looked at the king and queen and said, your majesties, are you certain that is the answer? Because if you were to ask me that question, I would say something quite different. And she told them. And one after another, the ladies in waiting came forward and each one of them had a different answer to the question, what is it that women truly want? And Arthur's heart sank inside him. He even went down to the kitchen and he asked the kitchen girls the same question and he got a really different set of answers from them. And this went on all week. Arthur asked his nephew, Sir Gawain, to accompany him as he went around collecting answers and Gawain wrote everything down. So Gawain was also a great help in encouraging some of the women to talk more freely. Sir Gawain was everyone's favourite at court. I mean, Sir Gawain was tall and golden and gorgeous and blue-eyed and so very, very kind. He was a truly gentle man. He was the kind of man that all the women felt safe with. They could flirt with him, they could dance with him, and he was utterly to be trusted. And so, even if they were a little nervous speaking with the king, with Sir Gawain, they would say exactly what they felt about that question. King Arthur and his court spent the soberest New Year's Eve of their entire lives. New Year's Day was a holiday for all the servants. And so at the appointed hour, 
It was Arthur himself who was down in the stables tacking up his horse to ride out and try to answer the question. The king's heart was almost in his boots. He knew he would have to trust to his God, to his luck, to pure chance, to pick from all the scrolls that he put in his saddlebag to pick the right answer. But it did not occur to him for a moment not to fulfill his promise. And as always happens with a horse when you're nervous, it jigged about and Arthur's fingers were fumbling so much he could hardly do up the girth and he couldn't get the bridle on because the horse was flinging its head up and time was passing. And then Sir Gawain was in the stables. Without a word he came to help his king tack up the horse. And then Gawain said, Sire, uncle, I am coming with you. And it wasn't the done thing. Arthur probably should have refused him. But Arthur was actually very frightened and Gawain's company was welcome. And so a little time later, the two men set out riding side by side and their horses' breath plumed in the frosty air. And just as on Christmas Day, there were streaks of red-gold sunset up above the hills. And once again, Arthur decided to take the shortcut up to the moors, the shortcut that led through the woods. And five minutes in, both men, although they were together, they were completely lost. I mean, they knew the track. They knew the shortcut through the woods perfectly well. Their horses knew the shortcut up through the woods. It didn't help that the low branches were ladling snow into all their faces. But they lost their way completely. But Arthur and Gawain had ridden on enough campaigns together to know that there are times when you've just got to leave it to the horse. They let their reins go slack and the horses surged forwards full of confidence. So the two men concentrated on ducking under the low branches and just putting up with being slapped in the face by snow and wet leaves and twigs. Arthur and Gawain rode into a clearing. In the middle of the clearing was a pool of green-black water. All around the edge were tall evergreen trees. And in the gloom of that clearing, the holly tree on the far side speckled all over with scarlet berries. That holly tree really stood out. It was towering above every other tree. But at the base of the holly tree was something else, a red shape. As Arthur and Gawain rode closer, they saw that the red shape was a woman magnificently robed in red velvet, sitting with her back to them on a fallen tree trunk. And from the way that she hunched forward, it seemed that she might be weeping. Her robes were superb, red velvet and silk, and a great headdress covered sparkling with rubies and pearls. Arthur rode forward a little, and he said, Madam, I give you greeting, I give you good day, and would you mind very much telling us where we are? And the red form straightened up a little and very slowly the woman turned around to look at them. And Arthur and Gawain recoiled. Even their horses took a step back because the woman was hideous. Her face was a misshapen oval of horror. Little piggy eyes, tufts of hair sprouting in all directions, particularly from the nose. A twisted mouth with big yellow rat-like teeth and drool and snot and more tufts of 
hair where hair should never be. Arthur and Gawain were speechless. The loathly lady said, oh, cat got your tongue, eh? Well, if you can't be politer than that, I ain't gonna help you. You better find your manners if you want me to help you with that question. Ah. Uh... Arthur gathered his courage. <laughs> Arthur gathered himself together and he said, Madam, if you can help us, if you can help me survive the peril of this adventure, I will be so grateful to you. Madam, if you can help me, if there is any gift, any boon I can grant you that is within my power and the law to do so, then I shall. And the loathly lady said, ah, oh, that's a bit better. Right, well, yes, I can help you. I can help you answer that stupid question. But I need a reward. It's like this. I've always wanted to get married and I've always wanted to marry a knight of the round table. Arthur, I want to marry one of your nicest knights. <laughs> Arthur's heart sank down into his boots. How could he ask one of the noble knights of the round table to marry that? He was doomed. He was dead. And that was when Sir Gawain, the golden and gorgeous, jumped down from his horse and he was on one knee in front of the loathly lady, looking up at her and smiling out of his blue, blue eyes. And he said, Madam, would I do? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yes, you do very, very nicely. I'll marry you. <laughs> right, Arthur. Get your royal backside off that horse and come here. I've got something to tell you. And the king had to get down from his horse and lean down close to the loathly lady. Oh, the stink that was coming off her. I mean, yes, people didn't wash very much in those days, but oh, the stench it was as if she went to the toilet in her clothes. But Arthur held his breath and leaned in and the loathly lady whispered certain words to him. Right, you two, get on up to meet that knight. He doesn't like to be kept waiting. So somewhat in a daze by now, Arthur and Gawain got back on their horses. And mind you come back to fetch me, don't you forget about that. And they found their way with no trouble at all to the edge of the woods. Arthur told Gawain to wait for him there and he rode up onto the moors. The cold mists wrapped themselves around him once again and a few moments later came the heavy thudding of hoofbeats. The black warhorse and the knight in black armour burst out of the fog and rained onto the haunches in front of the king and the black knight sniggered with laughter inside his battle helm. So you have come back to me, little king. At least you've had courage enough to keep your promise. And soon you shall be rotting in my dungeon. I will take you with me. Because there's no way in this world that you can know how to answer that question correctly. Mm. But of course you must have your chance. So, little king, tell me, if you can, what is it that women truly want? And Arthur looked straight at the Black Knight and he said, What women truly want is to make their own decisions. From inside the battle helm came a roar of rage. You've been talking to her. But no matter. That does not break the rules. Very well, I must release you for this moment. The Black Knight wrenched his horse's head around and he galloped away into the mists 
which writhed and parted, and Arthur was again free to ride back to the edge of the woods. There Gawain was waiting for him, and the two men found their way without any trouble at all back to the clearing, and there was the loathly lady in her stained red robes waiting for them. Gawain smiled and kissed the ladies filthy hands, and then he helped heave her up onto the saddle of his horse. She was no lightweight, but he got her there, and they set out to return to the castle. Up on the battlements, people were waiting and keeping lookout, and they gave a shout, and they started cheering as they saw the king and Gawain returning safely. As the horses' hooves clattered across the drawbridge into the courtyard, the courtyard was full and everyone started to cheer to welcome back their king and his nephew. And then they saw the loathly lady and the cheering stopped. Everyone stared. They stared at the misshapen face. They stared at the teeth. They stared at the tough of hair and the drool and the snot. And in among the crowd, the sniggering and the pointing started. But up at the top of the steps leading into the great hall, Queen Guinevere and her ladies in waiting observed what was happening. And Guinevere saw that the ladies' eyes were filling with tears. So as Gawain helped his betrothed down from the horse, Guinevere came down the steps and held out her hands to the loathly lady. Madam, I welcome you to Carlisle Castle. I welcome you to the court of my Lord King Arthur. Come with me, and with all courtesy and kindness, she welcomed the woman in the scarlet robes into Carlisle Castle. Through the marriage ceremony, the loathly lady wept for joy, tears and snot running down her face. No one really wanted another feast after a week of Christmas feasting, but it had to be done. And all through the feast, the loathly lady slobbered and guzzled and knocked back wine as if it was weak ale and demanded more and she stuffed her face and she seized handfuls of food and stuffed her face some more and all the time that the loathly lady ate and drank Gawain her new husband smiled at her and fed her tidbits and took care of her as you should look after a lady who feasts beside you. After the feasting there was dancing, and Gawain danced every measure with his new wife. He never flinched once as she repeatedly trod on his feet. In fact, he smiled, he laughed, he lifted her up, and it took all his strength to swing her around in time to the music. But even Gawain's smile faltered when it was time for bed. As was the custom, King Arthur, Queen Guinevere and attendants escorted the newlyweds up to a fine bedchamber. There was a good fire blazing on the hearth. It was a four-poster bed swathed in rich blue damask curtains. The custom in full was to place the newlyweds in bed together but Arthur and Guinevere exchanged glances and shooed the attendants out and they themselves left the room and closed the door behind them. Gawain took off his clothes and got into bed and got to the far side of the bed and rolled over onto his side to face the wall and then the mattress behind him sagged and he felt cold, clammy, bare flesh pressing up against his own. Aren't you gonna give me a kiss then? We just got married. I want a kiss and a cuddle. 
Sir Gawain, knight of the round table, Sir Gawain the golden and gorgeous, then did the bravest thing he'd ever done in his life. He closed his eyes, he held his breath, he turned over in bed and and the lips that he kissed were honey sweet and soft as rose petals. Gawain opened his eyes to find himself being embraced by the most exquisitely beautiful woman he had ever seen. Gawain leapt out of bed, grabbed his sword, turned back to the bed and said, Who are you and what have you done with my wife? The gorgeous woman pushed back her glossy hair. She said, My lord, my husband, I am your wife. Your courage, your kindness, your kiss, they have lifted most of the evil enchantment that held me. But now, now I am compelled to ask you to make a choice. My lord, my husband, my love, would you have me ugly by day and fair by night, or ugly by night and fair by day? What would you choose for me, for us? And Gawain's head was spinning. He'd had wine, he'd had shock after shock. He couldn't think if his new wife was beautiful by day and ugly by night, it would be a nightmare for him. And also if she were that beautiful, then he would have to fight to defend her honor almost every other day with all those predatory men around. But if she were beautiful at night and ugly by day, then it might be a greater pleasure for him, but he'd still have to fight to defend her. He would have to fight to protect her against the mockery and the bullying. And then he thought of something else. This question was more important than the question itself. And what of the original question? What is it that women truly want? And Sir Gawain, the golden and gorgeous, took his new wife's hands into his own and looked into her eyes and he said, Madam, this is not a choice that I could make for you. Certainly not. Only you, madam, can know what you can bear to live with. This is not a choice for me. Madam, you must make your own decision. And the beautiful woman said, yes, you've done it. You've completely broken the enchantment. My love, you have set me free to live as you see me now. And Gawain didn't even have time to smile as his lovely wife threw her arms around him and behind those blue damask curtains of that great double bed that night there was no more talking in the bedchamber. <laughs>